The first question, ready or not, asked us to predict the number of remote ready jobs in 2024 and 2027 in the following cities, each with their own unique economic and geographic situations. The general idea for our model was we would find the percentage of remote ready jobs per industry, find the total number of jobs per industry, and then simply multiply them and add them over all industries to find the number of remote ready jobs in a city. Our first assumption is that there wouldn't be any significant technological advancements within the next five years. This is because they're often unpredictable, and even if they do occur, it often takes time to implement them due to social, economic, and political barriers. The second assumption is that the trends for job growth are city-specific. Like we said before, each city has their own unique economic and geographic situations. A port is a port. The third assumption is that trends for job growth are linear. This is because a linear model will predict a general trend over a shorter period of time without overfitting to regional data. And finally, the percentage of remote readiness for an industry is an average of the percentage of remote readiness for each sub-industry. This is an oversimplification, and if we were to improve our model, the first thing we'd do would be find a weighted average by sub-industry size. So you can see that, for example, in the construction and extraction sub-industry, 0% of that sub-industry is remote ready, versus architecture and engineering, which is 61% remote ready. However, the sub-industries did not have the numbers for total number of workers, but the industry, such as mining, logging, and construction, did. In order to marry these two numbers, we simply took the average of the sub-industry remote readiness and found that mining, logging, and construction is 15.75% remote ready. Doing this over many sub-industries, we get the following data. The way we categorize sub-industries into industries was not rigorous. Next, we use linear regression to predict the total number of jobs per industry. You can see that Liverpool's graph looks pretty good. But Scranton's financial activity sector may look like a quadratic model would have been a better fit. However, notice that the dip occurs in the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis. This shows that a linear model will take into account the fact that these crises will occur. Financial crises are inevitable, but they're often hard to predict. Thus, a linear model will predict the general trend without overfitting to every single financial crash. Now we just multiply the two numbers, the total number of jobs per industry and the percentage that is remote ready. Adding this across all sub-industries per city, we get the number of remote ready jobs per city. Now looking at these percentages, you notice that there's quite a variation between Seattle's 42% and Liverpool's 27%. We believe this is due to the different industrial makeups of the different cities. Seattle's a port city. It probably has jobs related to that. Now we notice that there's a very little change of remote readiness between 2022 and 2027. We also believe this is due to the industrial makeup. It is very difficult to change a city's entire industrial makeup within just five years. Like I said before, a port city isn't gonna suddenly stop being a port city. Also, Liverpool actually decreased. We believe this is due to the fact that Liverpool's non-remote ready job sectors must have grown faster than its remote ready job sectors. In question two, we, we, we were tasked with predicting the chance that an employer of a remote ready job will allow the option of remote work and that an, an employee will choose to work remotely. Um, so employers and and employees both both need to gain from remote work for it to be offered and taken the combined financial gain of both the of both the employer and the employee is split between both parties therefore a combined positive positive benefit is the only thing that is needed to yield re remote work our first assumption is that hybrid workers are counted as working from home this is since each hybrid worker is its own case. So for, for, for the purpose of, of our model, they are classified as at-home workers. Our second assumption is that the rate of a worker's time is equal to the hourly wage rate that they are paid. This is because the single greatest gain to any at-home worker is the time that they gain. And we will ignore smaller, uh, other smaller, smaller, smaller benefits in our model. Our third assumption is that the choice to work from home is based on the economic benefits to both the worker and the employer, as stated before. Our fourth assumption is that workers are able to work on site. This is because a choice between in-person and at-home work needs to be present for cost, cost benefit 
analysis to be done, as our model does. Our fifth assumption is that workers who work from home do not need to pay for childcare. Although this only impacts a small section of the workforce, it impacts that section very heavily, so we do account for it in our model. Our first model objective is to look at the employer side benefits, which are mainly based in increases in worker productivity delta P, which has an average value of around 0.22. However, this is not true for every worker. So we sample our delta P value from a normal distribution centered at 0.22 with a sigma value of 0.5, which was specifically chosen to ensure that delta P values of less than zero can still be sampled. This gives our final employer benefit as BE equals to delta P times the hourly wage rate W times the time of the workday TW. The second objective is to look at the worker side benefits. The gain of, of, no, of no commute time is given as BC equals to the, the time of the commute TC times the hourly wage rate W. And for those workers who do require childcare, the gain of no childcare is given as BD equals to the time of the workday T, T, TW times the, the, the number of kids K times the hourly rate of childcare CD. And the total worker benefit is just the sum of these two values. Our final step is to combine our worker and employer benefits to get our final measure of, of, of economic gain, BT. And as long as BT is positive, then the worker will work from home. This includes the case where BE is initially less than zero because BT is split between both parties. To test our model, we initially wanted to run a Monte Carlo simulation for all five random variables. However, it's very hard to find information on, on all five because they, they have separate values for based on their, based on their industry and their um, area. For example, the, the commute time of a job in, in Texas is much longer than one in San Francisco, and the delta P for a freelancer is much, much different from that of a project manager. So we chose to only run a Monte Carlo simulation on delta P. And we ran it on two hypothetical workers, Mamma Mia and Basic Bill. And we fixed their, the, the values of the other four random variables with the value shown in the upper table, 2.5.1. And the results of our Monte Carlo simulation are shown in, 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 in the lower table, 2.5.2. And from these results, our team, uh, our, our team found out that one of the most important factors in choosing whether a worker will work from home or not will be the number of childcare aged kids that they have. Also, we, we ran a, a sensitivity analysis on, on, our, on our model by changing the value of sigma from 0.1 all the way to 0.9. And as seen, as we increase our value of sigma, the, the, the model uh, prediction steadily decreases. And overall, we made a framework for choosing whether a worker will work from home, which can be easily modified to incorporate the other four random variables once we find sufficient information for them. For the third problem, just a little homework, we were asked to predict the percentage of workers who would choose to work remotely for the earlier five cities. We were then asked to extend our predictions into 2025, or 2024 and 2027, and then rank the cities in terms of remote work's impact on them. For our model, we combined our results from question one and question two to find the city's percentages of remote workers. We then quantified the environmental and economic effects of remote work to rank the cities by impact. Our first assumption is that the average commute distance will not change within the next five years, and that remote workers will have no commute. Our second assumption is that the current trend of suburbanization will continue, as the mass migration from suburbs into cities would be a sudden and unprecedented change in behavioral patterns. Our third assumption is that the economic impact of remote workers leaving a city will be equal to the loss of property tax. This is because property tax, unlike sales or income tax, is the only tax paid directly to the city, and it serves as a good indicator of a household's local economic contributions. For example, a household with a high property tax will likely contribute more to the local economy than a household with a low property tax. Our fourth assumption is that the environmental impact of remote work will be equal to the carbon emissions from driving, as commuting makes up the majority of additional carbon emissions that come with office work. Our fifth and final assumption is that the value of carbon will be standardized across the United States and the United Kingdom using the United Kingdom's carbon tax. Carbon trading across the US and the UK will standardize carbon's price. 
However, since many states have yet to implement a cap-and-trade system, UK prices are better for projections into the future, as they've been used over a broader geographic area and for a longer period of time. For our model synthesis, we combined the results from question one and question two to find the percentage of workers that would choose to work from home. As you can see here, the percentage of workers that will choose to work from home is equal to the percentage of workers with remote-ready jobs times the percentage chance that a worker with a remote-ready job will actually choose to work remotely. And here are the inputs for our model synthesis. We considered the average demographics for each city to determine probability values. We're aware that averages aren't the best since they may be skewed in one direction or the other, but again, due to time and hardware constraints, we needed to simplify our Monte Carlo simulation, so this is what we went with. You can see that we use the average number of childcare-aged kids per person, the average workday length and hour, the average wage rate, and finally, the average commute time. And here are results, which you can see in the bolded white rows. If you look closely, you can see that from 2022 to 2027, the percentage of workers who will work from home does not increase by much, and in Liverpool, once again, decreases. For our impact determination, we compared the carbon and property tax values to the city's GDPs to quantify the changing behavioral patterns. If you look, the carbon tax is significantly smaller than the tax change for each city. And as we will soon explain, this will typically mean that remote work will have a negative impact on almost every single city. For our impact calculation, we combined the individual impact of a single worker choosing to work remotely with our synthesis results to determine the total impact of an industry shifting to remote work. So as you can see here, the environmental benefit is equal to the benefit from reduced carbon emissions times the number of people working from home. The economic loss is equal to the loss in property tax times the number of people working from home times the percent chance that a remote worker will actually choose to move out of a city. So and finally, for our total impact, we simply took the absolute value of the benefit minus the loss and divided that by each city's GDP to make impact a relative factor based on each city's size. And here are our results. As you can see, our impact goes Liverpool, Barrie, Seattle, Scranton, and finally, Omaha. The impacts are displayed in the bolded white row and are expressed as a percentage of each city's GDP. Although this is a monetary value, remember again, this is an economic factor. Um, we'd like to thank Siam, MathWorks, uh, the judges for having us. Um, we really appreciate you listening. Thank you all. Nice presentation. Um, I have a question about, um, I guess maybe it goes back to the model for uh, a worker choosing to work remotely. And, and I think in the two examples that you presented, there were pretty high percentages for both of them. Um, what would have to be some of the parameter values that would end up giving a prediction where a worker would choose to not work from home. Does that yeah, of course. So in our model, we had worker benefit and employer benefit. And worker benefit will always be positive because we had the time gained and the cost of reduced childcare. So those values will never dip under zero. The only parameter that will allow our model to go under zero would be the ch our, our uh, delta p value. So because we have that um, 0.5 sigma, then we can sample values that are less than zero. And sometimes that value is great enough that we dip our total benefit under zero. We understand that this isn't a perfect model because if a, a worker works from home, they miss out on that office culture and all that other stuff. But this is the, the simplified model that we were able to come up with during the time of our presentation, I mean, of our competition. <laughs> So I have a follow-up question on that. It, um, it, that makes the way you explain it makes me feel like that choice of sigma at the 0.5 standard deviation w would have big impact on your model. If it was larger, I guess there'd be a higher probability that the benefit would be negative. So can you comment on how that value was chosen? Yeah, of course. So that goes back to our sensitivity analysis. So we so that was a big factor in what we chose. We were very stuck on what value of sigma to actually choose. So we ran our um, sensitivity analysis from all the way from 0.1 to 0.9. So we found that 0.5 was a nice medium allowing for values that are under uh, zero to be sampled, but still allowing for most of the sampling to be around that average range. 
Can you comment on maybe how you could have chosen it in a more data-driven way? More data -driven. We actually did look around. We actually did look around quite a bit for like a sigma value from data, um, but every number we found either didn't like um, make sense in the context, mm -hmm. or um, it was simply not the right number. Okay, thank you. The last question. Um, no, we have like four minutes. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Am I just working? Okay, great. So, this is one of my favorite things to consider. Your question um, you, you had a lot of interesting factors that influenced a person's decision to work remotely. One of them was savings on childcare. So, do you think then that uh, people with younger children are more inclined to work from home while simultaneously taking care of their children?